Oh, and by the way, we're uh, recording this all. I just turned it on. This partnership that we're uh, established with MDC Partners, we decided to go out there and you know, really ask journalists. We surveyed the community of muckrack journalists of over 25,000 to get a sense of how they really use social media to gather the news, to work it into their day. And we found talking to the PR community and to journalists too who aren't as into social media, there are a lot of misconceptions. There are all these kind of questions everybody has. Should you pitch journalists over Twitter for journalists? Is it worth your time? We've talked to a lot of journalists who still say, hey, I'm so busy. How am I supposed to add social media to my workload? So with this survey, uh, we, we kind of listened to the community, both from journalists and from the PR world, asked journalists at scale these questions and have some very exciting results to share with you. So this was our, uh, our first couple of questions. We wanted to know if journalists actually like it when PR people follow them. A lot of PR people have um, kind of hesitations, how they should use Twitter, should they engage with journalists on Twitter, does it come across the wrong way if they follow the journalists? The, uh, the answer is overwhelmingly they do like getting followed by people, uh, people, particularly people who they're working with on the communication side. 93% said that they do, and when you think about it, I guess it's not too surprising because who doesn't want more followers? The next thing we asked was, which social network journalists find most valuable to do their job? And uh, you know, the answers range between Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, even Snapchat, Tumblr. We uh, we gave them the whole gamut. 79% chose Twitter. And I think that's kind of remarkable in that, um, you know, in terms of just scale of users, Twitter, you know, is of course one of the biggest, but not the biggest. Yet I think, you know, one of the real strong powers of Twitter that we've always seen both with Muckrack and the Shorty Awards firsthand is that it's particularly valuable for journalists. We've seen they really use it to do their job, kind of the real time nature of it speaks to them. The fact that it's all public really speaks to them. But so we, we, we had a hunch it would be over 50%, but seeing 70, 79% I think says something kind of really special about what it is that Twitter does in that it, it is the tool of choice for journalists. And that's why we were so excited we could get Mark Lucky to join us, who's a long time uh, longtime journalism manager at Twitter has fulfilled. Well, I'll let him talk more about his role with that. But Mark himself has been a journalist and founded the very popular blog, 1000 Words, before he joined Twitter. So I think he can bring us a very interesting perspective, both from his uh, tenure at Twitter, but also his experience on the other side of being a journalist. So, Mark, if um, you can join us now. It would be great if you could just start with uh, an introduction. I'll pull up your Twitter handle very soon, but if you could introduce yourself by uh, both Twitter handle and your name and what you do over at Twitter. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Greg. I really appreciate it. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Mark Lucky. Um, as Greg said, I'm the manager of journalism news at Twitter. Uh, I focus on creative and editorial content. Uh, and I'm at Marcus Lucky on Twitter. Lucky is L-U-C-K-I-E. Uh, so what do I do at Twitter? It's a really good question. So what I do is to help uh, journalists and newsrooms move the needle in terms of how they use social media and Twitter. Um, and that can be anything from the big Twitter integrations that you see on uh, TV and digital and radio and in print. Um, to uh, best practices sessions um, inside of newsrooms. Uh, essentially, you know, we understand that journalists are using Twitter, and we've got a team of um, reform journalists, I like to say, who uh, work inside Twitter, who understand how the industry works and are helped to provide uh, the resources uh, for that. And so one of the things about Twitter is that, uh, we're, uh, yes, you can use it to tweet out your stories, uh, but you can also use it to detect news, uh, to engage with your readers, or uh, or your viewers, and also um, 
to report on stories, to um, engage with sources. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do is to uh, facilitate the best way to do that on Twitter. Good. And it'd be really uh, great to hear, Mark, how, you know, what are the really interesting ways that journalists use using Twitter and how do they have to think about using Twitter different in the way mm-hmm. from just the average uh, Joe that's on there to, uh, to follow Justin Bieber? Sure. Uh, well, I will say that a lot of journalists follow Justin Bieber, so uh, you wouldn't be out of pocket <laughs> if you do. Fair uh, I, uh, <laughs> I apologize for making assumptions about journalists. <laughs> if there are any believers on the call, um, you can beat Greg up after after the call. Uh, so um, how do journalists use Twitter? Well, I think the most interesting way uh, that journalists are using Twitter currently is to document what's happening right in front of them. Uh, you can see that from everything from Ferguson to the Hong Kong protests uh, to court cases, things that are happening around them, because essentially what you're doing as a journalist is drawing people into your story. Um, If Twitter feels like work, it shouldn't be. It should be a part of your reporting process. The best journalists are using Twitter as a reporter's notebook, uh, that they are sharing what's happening as they see it. Um, And so that makes people uh, more interested in the story. It makes people more interested in the journalist. But we see huge spikes in uh, follower growth and engagement whenever a journalist live tweets. Um, For me, one of the most interesting things now is around uh, the data on Twitter. Uh, Using Twitter not as a way to say Joe said this or Jane said this, using one or two examples, but to talk about what all of uh, Twitter is um, is saying about a particular subject. And so if you follow at Twitter data on Twitter, what you'll see is some examples of that. Um, Everything from visual maps, heat maps of uh, conversations on Twitter to highlighting the most influential tweets around a particular subject. Uh, finding trendy items all over the world. There's so much that you can do with this trip, uh, with the uh, with the Twitter uh, platform because it is real time. It's where people go to converse about the things that are happening around them. And most importantly, a lot of people are their natural instinct is to pick up their phone and to tweet what's happening around them. So as a journalist, you have this un, uh, this uh, limitless. Uh, experience that you can be a part of, uh, not only to share what you're working on, but also uh, to talk with your sources, uh, talk with people in the community, whereas you'd have to pick up the phone or you'd have to go door to door uh, previously. And what are you finding, what what do you say to the journalists uh, that are still skeptical and say they're just too busy for Twitter, they have too much to do? (laughs) <laughs> well, with the holidays coming up, one of the things uh, that we joke around Twitter is if you can get your mom or your grandmother on Twitter, uh, then uh, then you're you're made. Um, and so I've successfully got my mother and grandmother to join Twitter, uh, mostly because I encourage them to <laughs> I encourage them to follow their uh, the sources that they like. You know, follow uh, your favorite newspapers, your favorite columnists, your favorite authors, your favorite celebrities. Uh, tweet along with your favorite TV show. You don't have to sort of jump in and start tweeting about your stories, but when you listen and get an understanding of how the platform um, is being used, then you get a, a really good idea of uh, how it can be useful to you. And the last thing that I'll say is um, um, the Pope is on Twitter, and he's a busy man, so if the Pope can be on Twitter, then anybody can be on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get ready to uh, pitch the Pope. That's so, right. Uh, <laughs> we got to get him to join Muckrack. Oh, that's right. That's our uh, – actually, next time you're talking to him, Mark, if you could uh, just put that in casually in conversation, we'd, uh, we'll do. we'd, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> and so what do you say um, – how do you find journalists are using Twitter to actually – uh, not just cover news, but to source news. You see journalists using this to actually, you know, put the how to get story ideas or to research for stories or find sources. So uh, Twitter search is exceptionally powerful. Um, you can search for anything on Twitter um, and find people talking about it. Um, you know, anything from uh, protests to you know the types of food that people are eating. I think there's actually a Twitter visualization out there that is a tree map of the most popular foods that people are eating or tweeting about at any particular time. And so if you're a journalist and you're trying to research a subject, any terms from jobs to the economy to you know local events, you can do that just by starting with a 
Twitter search. And what I recommend is to search for natural language, the things that people are, are naturally uh, likely to include in their tweets. Uh, because when you do that, that becomes a source that you could reach out to. Um, and something as simple as you know, tweeting out, does anybody know someone who fill in the blank? Um, and if you have a really good engaged Twitter following, those people know people who know people uh, who could possibly help you out. And it's also important in that regard to make sure that you're using hashtags. Hashtags expose your tweet to a wider audience beyond the people who are just um, beyond just the people who are following you. Um, so using hashtags for uh, you know any number of things, usually it's the most simple. Uh, you know the the subject of the tweet is going to uh, reach that wider audience. And if you're still stuck, you can't find people to search for on Twitter, um, you can go into the Twitter website or on the Twitter mobile device, and you can, uh, instead of searching for tweets, you can search for people. So let's say I was trying to find journalists who live in New York. I could search journalists in New York on Twitter, click on people, and it will show me the influential uh, people that uh, that are on Twitter. And this is all determined by algorithm. And like I said, you can search for anything on Twitter. Uh, it's, it's really sort of fantastic. Uh, what do you say? I know a lot of people struggle with kind of finding the right balance. And I think this is true with journalists and with all of us, finding the right balance of being personal and being professional. You know, where on one hand, uh, you know, if somebody, you know, somebody represents the news organization they're with or the company they're with, they're going to tweet things that are official, but then also, they, you know, they want to post a selfie or a picture of their meal. How do you advise people to kind of, you know, balance that or, you know, can you pull, how, how do you pull that both into one Twitter profile and not get fired? Sure. So, uh, Greg, if you're still on my Twitter, profile on the screen, uh, feel free to scroll down a little bit. And you can see some examples of how I use Twitter and how I recommend that journalists use Twitter, uh, which is to mix up not just uh, tweets that are relevant to the subject that you cover. For example, for me it would be social media or uh, Twitter, journalism, that sort of thing. Uh, but mix it up with uh, things that are personal but relevant to the subject uh, that you cover. Uh, so for example, you know, how, you know, I've got a tweet up there with, uh, with uh, reading rainbow. I was feeling very optimistic this morning. And it's often those tweets that, get, that show a little bit of personality uh, that let people know who you are, not just a journalist, because no journalist is just the subject that they cover. But if you uh, add a little bit of personality, um, talk about things in a way that you would talk to it, uh, to your coworkers or to your friends, people are incredibly re receptive of that. Ultimately on Twitter, people want to connect with uh, human beings. They don't want to connect with robots. And you'll find that the most successful journalists on Twitter are the ones who talk, remembering that social media is social and that you want to interact with people. Now, should you be posting selfies of you at a bar or an all-night bender, you know, on vacation in Cabo? Probably not. Um, you don't want to post anything that will get you fired or will cause controversy. Uh, one of the things that I like to keep in mind is that, um, that you should tweet the news but not be the news. And so when you keep that in mind and think about would I yell this in the middle of Times Square or would I you know, post this in the newsroom um, on a piece of paper, if the answer is no, then just don't tweet it. But certainly uh, think about the things that are personal to you, uh, your personal interests, whether that's sports or cats or, or anything, uh, feel free to tweet that. Um, and people, like I said, are actually more likely to engage with you if you, uh, if you include non-links, uh, tweets that are not links in your tweets versus just having all links. As you can see, I'm transfixed by the uh, Reading Rainbow gift that you posted, <laughs> which I think gives me a nice segue where uh, just being able to post a gift to Twitter is a relatively new feature. Uh, if I remember right, it used to not always support gifts. And no. um, I wanted to, uh, aside from just getting the confirmation on that, I wanted to, uh, to ask kind of about rich media now. You also, Twitter has launched uh, Vine, I guess about maybe a year and a half ago now, which uh, you know, we've seen again with the, especially with the Shorty Awards, it's um, emerged as one of our most popular categories. So, you know, in general, um, how do you 
see uh, kind of Twitter changing? What do you think journalists need to think about and any kind of communicator needs to think about now that there's Vine and GIFs and, and these kind of ways to bring more rich media into their Twitter feeds? Sure. Um, so Twitter is incredibly visual because people are used to communicating visually, um, going all the way back to grandma with the with the scrapbook, showing off baby pictures. Um, it's the same on Twitter where people are not just 140 uh, characters in text, that uh, people want to share photos, they want to share gifts, they want to share video. And so Twitter in the last year or so has created the capacity to do that. Um, so interestingly enough, tweets with photos actually are two times as uh, likely to get retweeted as tweets that don't have photos. And then we're seeing major impact around vines. If you were uh, following the, uh, if you're following the protests out in Ferguson, you'll know that some of the most impactful uh, tweets were those that included the six-second videos in it. Because not only did you have still photos, and not only did you have um, the tweets that were describing what's happening, but you could actually uh, feel like you were in there and experiencing it. And so thinking aside from news, being able to record these video snippets and to uh, post them very quickly, that is uh, the future. Um, it's the now, actually, uh, being able to share these um, your know, rich media. So if you have a smartphone, you know, and you take a picture, or if you have a, a video, definitely tweet it out. Uh, it's going to get that great engagement, especially if it's content that your followers are interested in. Good, and Mark, we just got a uh, tweet from uh, at Sila saying uh, one of the best things about the Muckrack webinar is seeing the at Reading Rainbow slash at LeVar Burton gif shared by Mark <laughs> So uh, very, very nice situation. <laughs> Thanks. I, I'm tweeting out those photos, man. I, I try. Great. I'm also starting to see some questions come in, so I'm uh, saving those, and we'll come back to it at the end. But um, we can talk more about Twitter then. I'm going to jump back into the survey results. Uh, but thanks so much for sharing all that, Mark, and we'll we'll be back with you soon. Thank you. All right, so that concludes the talk about the uh, most popular social network in the world among journalists. The next thing we wanted to ask was uh, something that you know we hear a lot of frustration from from journalists and a lot of uncertainty about from people who want to reach journalists, which is how long should your email to a journalist be? How long should a pitch be? So we decided to actually ask the journalists and. You know, we've seen there's this kind of default that's emerged where people will send a thousand word press release to every journal so they want to have cover something. But in actuality, anything over 500 words is preferred by less than 5% of journalists. The vast majority want two to three paragraph pitch, which seems like the amount where you can kind of get the crux of it through without every last detail. And still a sizable amount, 36% want just two to three sentences in the pitch. So what we're seeing from this is that, I guess a similar theme with Twitter is that brevity is starting to rule the world and no different with pitches. So it's a kind of a powerful, um, powerful signal that we're seeing here from journalists. After that, we wanted to ask, how did journalists prefer to receive pitches. One kind of piece of uncertainty and misconception we get from people is that they hear, okay, journalists are on Twitter and I should be using Twitter to find journalists and follow them. So does that mean I also have to pitch the journalist over Twitter? And what we found interestingly was that uh, the, the same journalists where 90% of them prefer, want you to follow them on Twitter, still 92.8% of them want you to contact them by email, not by uh, you know, over options like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. And I think that the reason for this uh, you know, makes a lot of sense that Twitter, it can be kind of tricky to make a pitch over there if, you know, you're, if their journalist isn't already following you unless they change your settings, you can't direct message them, which means you'd have to pitch them publicly and by definition, they're not getting a scoop because they see that anybody 
could have seen that you made that pitch. Also, 140 characters, uh, I love it, but it, it can be a little bit limiting. You could always send a couple DMs. But unless you already have a you know, really strong rapport with a journalist, it's, it's hard to message them in any meaningful way over Twitter. So what we usually recommend with Muckrack in keeping with this, and we've kind of built out a platform to do it, is that you use the signals from Twitter, you search Twitter, find the right journalist to pitch, see who's talking about the topic that you care about, see who's covered that topic in the past. You get the signals, what they've shared on Twitter and other social networks too, also you know, search through their past articles. But when it comes to actually making that contact, follow them, build a relationship on Twitter, but then actually reach out to them by email. We also asked uh, journalists, and you know, again, one thing a lot of people wonder about, especially people who haven't been in the kind of news world so long, is like, do you need a personal connection with the journalist to be able to give them a story idea? And what we found is 91% of journalists said you don't, that they do respond to pitches from people they don't already personally know. Only 9% said that they uh, wouldn't respond to a pitch from somebody they don't already know. So I think it's a, a good kind of message of hope for people looking um, looking to kind of break into the news world who have an idea, have something that they think is worth covering, but don't already have a strong uh, strong network of journalists. You know, the caveat to that is I think is if you don't know the journalists, it's even more incumbent on you to do really vigorous research before you contact the journalist, see what they're tweeting about, see what they're writing about, and then reach out. Another big question is what time of day to pitch journalists? I know uh, this is something I've always struggled with launching the Shorty Awards, and you know, we have a lot of press announcements. And I'm a night owl. I'm always uh, working on my email late at night, yet it turns out only 15% uh, of journalists actually want to be, uh, or sorry, even less, uh, only 4% of journalists want to be pitched between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So if you're staying up past 10, hold that email. And the vast majority of journalists want to be pitched in the morning, 43% specifically between 9 and 11 a.m. Another 27% even earlier between 6 and 9 a.m. This is all really bad news for someone who's not a morning person like myself, but it's important to know, and uh, I will drink some extra coffee in the morning if need be. And when you combine the two, the vast majority of journalists want to be pitched before 11 a.m., the reason we've heard from that in talking to journalists more qualitatively is that they just plan their day in the morning. They wake up with this big problem every morning. What do I write about throughout the day? What do I have to cover? What's, what's going to be important for my beat? And so being able to connect with them at a good point in the news cycle when they're up in the morning, uh, surprisingly, I guess many of them are morning people and kind of plotting out their day is a much better time to reach out to them than waiting till the evening when I know many of us actually get around to writing it. And you might even want to think about using tools like Boomerang to, uh, if you use Gmail or Outlook, uh, to schedule your emails so that if you are like me and you stay up till, uh, till 11 or midnight writing emails, that you schedule them to actually go out in the morning. Now with that, we've got some more survey to get through, but I want to break this up and kick it over to uh, Michael Basick. I'll reload his uh, profile really quick. He promised me that he might uh, tweet a selfie that we can all see here. But Michael has been <laughs> a um, good uh, great friend of ours for a while. He was one of the first people ever to sign up for Muckrack when we were readying it and gave us very valuable feedback long-time executive in the communication world, and now at MDC Partners. So uh, first of all, Michael, welcome. Tell us about uh, how you're thinking of lighting your selfie and also what you do over at MDC. Yeah, that, that's the backstory. I didn't know if it was going to be uh, video included in this, so uh, I'm wearing a very special outfit today. But you now you will just have to take my word for it. Uh, thanks, Greg and Natan, for uh, for inviting me to participate in this survey with you all. Um, 
quick overview of MDC Partners for those who are not aware. We're one of the leading and fastest growing global agency holding companies uh, known initially for our work um, out of our great creative agencies like Crispin Porter Bogutsky and 72 and Sunny. Our network today includes uh, over 60 of the most creative and talented firms spanning creative, media, technology, data, and of course public relations and strategic communications. Um, my role is, is to support the efforts of our PR firms as well as to help all of our agencies across the network leverage the power of digital and social media. Um, it's worth mentioning to some of the firms in our network, Allison and Partners, Hunter PR, um, Veritas in, in Canada are some of the best mid-sized PR firms today and, and all of them are, are using Muckrack and, and use the, the results of this survey to help inform the work they're doing. Great, and can you let me know, like, uh, you, you've been, um, you've kind of gotten to see a really wide view of the whole communications world. How has Twitter and social media just changed the way that things work? Or, or has it at all? Uh, it's tremendously. I think especially as it pertains to the way in which PR firms communicate and connect with journalists, before Twitter, I think we all know the primary way a journalist would communicate outwardly, proactively with readers and communications professionals was to publish stories. Uh, so with the advent of Twitter, we see journalists not only sharing the stories they write, but sharing ideas, sharing thoughts, sharing other stories that interest them. I think Mark earlier said a lot of journalists using Twitter as a journalist notebook, for example. So it's become a very valuable tool not just to connect with journalists, uh, but to really better understand what drives them, what their passions are, what they're interested in, what a specific point of view is. Uh, so when we reach out to a journalist, it's more informed and, and relevant to conversation. And, and the results of this survey sort of speak for themselves. Journalists basically said they want you to stalk them. 93% they said they appreciate when someone in public relations follows them. That's an invitation to follow, to learn, to, to really understand the voice and to engage. You know, this is a two-way medium, and, and the promise of using Twitter is the promise that you're going to engage. So the idea that journalists are saying they want you to follow them is also an open invitation to engage with them and communicate with them across social media. Now, Michael, with MDC, you guys have um, this whole partnership of different PR agencies, and I've got to say I'm a particular fan of two of them, uh, particularly uh, Allison. I hope no one else is listening, but uh, Allison PR, <laughs> they got me a cronut at uh, South by Southwest when they flew down <laughs> and fell down, and Hunter PR, whose uh, client, Johnny Walker, they've been able to uh, – supply us with several uh, complimentary uh, whiskeys. So thank, thank you and your partnership for that. But I see, you know, both with your role at MDC and your prior roles working at large agencies, obviously, you know, you understand social media and Twitter, as we can see from your, uh, your profile here. But then you've got this agency of um, hundreds and thousands of people I think, you know, a lot of us feel, I even see it now and, uh, you know, with my company, that it gets more challenging the bigger you get. So you understand Twitter uh, and social and how this is changing with journalists. But then how do you take your team along with you? How do you take, you know, this whole group of uh, professionals, some of whom, you know, are maybe older and less tech savvy, you know, some of whom are uh, much younger and kind of just getting their start? How how do you get? How do you bring your team along, and how do you teach the whole team how to uh, kind of adapt for the social media era? That that's a great question. Uh, I always say, if you don't constantly feel like you're falling behind, you must be doing something wrong. Uh, it's an incredibly exciting and interesting time to be working in public relations. It's also, and I've heard other people say that it's maddening and it's scary time to work in public relations, uh, where those who are just starting out in the field, some of them who are just graduating college, have in many respects a deeper understanding of how consumers and audiences today discover and engage with content than the agency's more senior staff. Uh, so the only way to keep up, and this is advice I would give to anybody, is to do it all and to try it all. 
if you hear people are trying out a new application, a new product, a new service and communications, you have to try it. If people are talking about secret, you have to download secret. You don't have to become an expert in it, but you have to be familiar with it to understand the way in which communications are changing. And when people start talking about Snapchat, you have to go ahead and download Snapchat. You have to keep abreast of the changes and the trends. You can't be afraid to experiment. You can't be afraid to fail. Go and create a Vine if you've never created a Vine. Go and pin something if you've never pinned something. Uh, Muckrack is a free tool. It's free to sign up. Of course, there are other premium services that we find valuable, but there's no reason you shouldn't be experimenting with that. Uh, if you're single or if you're in an open marriage, go check out Tinder. I mean, like there, there are all these different types of applications that you need to be aware of to be on the cutting edge of communications. We were talking earlier about ELLO, E-L-L-O. You have to um, request an invitation now, but there's talk of it being the next Facebook killer. Uh, these are applications you have to be aware of. At the same time, I hope I'm sorry, I feel like I'm ranting now, but at the same well, actually, time, my next question is going to be, what's your LO strategy? So this is uh, this is perfect. Right. What's your LO strategy? What's your LO strategy? At the same time, you look at the look at the results. Ninety-three percent of journalists still prefer to be pitched over email. So it's still critical to remain aware of the basics of the phone, of email. Um, and not to get distracted by new technology, but you have to be aware of it. You can't ignore it. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. And um, I'm going to quickly run through the, um, the rest of the slides, and then that way I can open up the, uh, the questions. Again, you know, I already got a couple questions from people out there who have tweeted it with the hashtag muckrack, but if anybody else wants to ask more, please go ahead, and then I'll open it up so we can hear both what uh, Michael and Mark think about it. Let me just quickly pop back over to PowerPoint here and go through the rest of the results. We're going to talk about rejection now, and not just the kind on Tinder, but getting your pitch rejected. Uh, it happens to all of us. Usually rejection is silent, which makes it even worse just the journalist never responds to you. We want to know why. What, why aren't they responding to these pitches? So we ask them, of course, if you're sending them something irrelevant, uh, the pitch isn't going to be successful. But aside from that, what keeps you from being successful? The number one reason we found from journalists, 28% is lack of personalization. And we see this over and over, and I think it's um, kind of an industry how that for so long, people have been using mail merge, sending the same message out to you know, hundreds or even worse, thousands of journalists asking them to cover something. And of course, you know, if you get an email that's not customized, you're probably not going to respond to it. And for the journalists, we've heard from them that they really want to see that when they get pitched on something that you know, tailored to them, that the person show the respect of researching and seeing what they actually cover. I think it's also a signal that when you personalize it, you actually care about giving it to this particular journalist, and you're not just blasting the same thing out to that journalist and to hundreds of their competitors when you know, every journalist wants to try to get a unique take and write an article that no one else has yet. So uh, personalization is the most powerful thing. Uh, no surprise based on our study about how long a it should be, but actually 22% of journalists said, even after having a chance to say their piece in the survey about how long a pitch should be, saying that they reject pitches because they're too lengthy. And you talk to journalists who are really busy and they get these emails that are a thousand words long, you know, some long press release with jargon and meaningless executive quotes, and they look at that, they're busy, they're trying to clear out their inbox really fast because they have hundreds of other things sitting for them. And now it's, uh, it's throwing them off. So two links is another one. Uh, other than that bad timing, again, a call back to the time of day, but that timing really matters. Not just time of day, but we also see it really matters, you know, what time you're catching a journalist. So one thing we'll always do is before reaching out to a journalist, look at their Twitter feed. You can get a sense and see, hey, if this journalist is currently you know, covering breaking news, 
or you know, even on site at a conference covering something, it's probably a bad time to pitch them on something unrelated to that breaking news. At the same time, if you have an, you know, an expert or a study or something to contribute to that breaking news, it's the best time to pitch them. So this is another example where we see that the signals you can get from social media can really inform your pitch and make you much more effective and get a much higher rate. So with that, we, we decided when we did this survey, we let journalists give us free-form feedback, and we also gave them an option to go on the record with it, kind of turning the table on journalists. We, we had a fair number of journalists uh, willing to reveal their names, and you can see we got some great responses here. Uh, one from Christina Binkley uh, from Wall Street Journal reminding us to picture a real story, that she's not here to write ads, I think. That kind of speaks to the fact that you really have to put yourself in the journalist's shoes and think what's going to be news, what's going to matter. One final result for you before we open things up to questions is, is it all right if someone follows up with you after a pitch? This is kind of one of the biggest debates I always hear whenever I walk into a PR firm. Is like, okay, we pitch that guy, can we follow up? I've hear, heard uh, entrepreneurs, people you know, just trying to contact journalists on their own struggle with it too. Is it okay to follow up with this journalist after I pitched them and haven't heard back? Or does the fact that they didn't respond mean rejection and I should move along? 67% of journalists, which we found uh, very strong, said, yes, it's okay to do one follow-up. Only 5% said more were fine. Still a good chunk of journalists said don't follow up. But what we've seen is that uh, two-thirds of journalists pretty much are okay with the follow-up. And just anecdotally, I've seen working with uh, our users who are using Muckrack to connect with journalists. And when we've done press ourselves from the Shorty Awards and being on the other side, uh, I'd worked at CNN.com as an associate producer and ran my own podcast where it was an interview series and I'd have guests on, that that one follow-up is okay. A lot of us just miss things in our inbox. We're busy. Maybe we get the email when we're in the middle of a meeting or on vacation and can never get back and accomplish inbox zero. But a simple follow-up, what I'll usually do is just reply with one or two lines. So last email saying, hey, just making sure that you got this, being polite but just checking in, and that one follow-up I found can often double or even triple the response rate that you get from all the journalists that you're reaching out to. But the key is to do that follow-up in a tasteful manner, to be polite, to be upbeat, to assume that the person missed it just because they're busy like we all are, and also not to go to the extreme. Don't follow up five times. That's, the, uh, that's it for our journal survey. So we can uh, move into some uh, questions now. We got um, a tweet a little while ago that I want to bring back up. And again, if you have more questions, just tweet them, hashtag muckrack, and we'll do our best to get to them. But of course, uh, you could also uh, always tweet at one of us if you're interested. This one is from uh, at Liz. I'll spell the last name so I don't butcher it. M-U-R-O-S-K-I, Liz Mazursky. Uh, interesting to hear about at Twitter data. would love to be able to measure analytics and actual data more often with this channel. I think that brings something up that's really interesting. If we could um, go back to you, Mark. Uh, Twitter's rolled out a lot of new stuff in terms of analytics and just data that you can deal with. What do people need to know about getting good analytics from Twitter? Sure. So you're right, Greg. We uh, recently rolled out uh, analytics to every single Twitter account. You can look at your tweets and see um, how they're doing in terms of engagement. Um, so if you go to analytics.twitter.com and sign in with your, uh, with your Twitter handle, uh, you will see um, that dashboard. Um, also, there are third-party analytics tools that are built on top of Twitter that can help you tell a more robust story about uh, what's happening on Twitter if that's what you're looking for. Uh, those resources are available at media.twitter.com. And if you missed any of that, um, I will tweet those links on the Muckrack hashtag. Great. So let's see. I'm uh, looking out for more questions now. 
You know, while I'm doing that, I had one question uh, for you, Michael. We talked a lot about how journalists need to organize their social presence and, you know, managing that uh, kind of divide between the, prefer the personal and the professional. But um, a question for you is, like, what do you, you know, do you think all that advice applies to people on the PR side? Sometimes it can be touchier with them, especially if they're with a... Uh, representing Fortune 500 companies. How, how do you advise people to approach social media and kind of walk that line the right way? Certainly. I mean, I think there's a, a common sense rule that just needs to be in the back of everybody's mind, which is this is a public medium. And anything you can, anything you say can and will be held against you. Uh, everything you've ever written in social media can come back. And you have to be thinking not just about your clients today, but perhaps your clients tomorrow. You also have to be thinking in context of your own personal career and where you may want to um, you know, work in the future or how you might want to expand your career within your, your existing organization. Uh, HR professionals, your colleagues, uh, your clients will go and check your social media profile before they engage with you. I think we're all guilty of this too. I mean, the first thing that happens when someone emails you, is you go check out what, they, what their profile is on LinkedIn, you see what they've written in social media, you, you Google them, uh, you read their last few tweets before you have a conversation. So anything that you would do, uh, other people are doing to you. So it's just important to be aware of that. We have a few other rules that we like to enforce um, which are disclosure. If you're going to talk about a client, to use the hashtag client is such a simple thing to do. It doesn't take up that many characters. And we found that you actually likely are to get more retweets and more engagements by disclosing that it's a client um, than not. So it's, a, it's a, an interesting thing to see how people respond to it, but it's also just best practice. That's great. I'm going to... Um Take the uh, take the next question here. I had one asking people if we asked journals specifically how they like being pitched over a muckrack, and I thought that would actually be a good opportunity to explain the way that our system works. Journals who sign up to receive pitches through muckrack actually end up just getting those pitches in their inbox. It looks to them almost like any other email, and they can simply reply to it and get straight to another journalist. So um, we didn't see any need to differentiate that between email itself, and we actually give the journalists the power to either just list their email address on their muckrack profile or to take the pitch through our kind of gateway, similar to almost how LinkedIn does messaging. But either way, it all results in email. So that's something that I wanted to clear up. One, um, one thing that I wanted to ask uh, you know, both of our speakers, too, is that um, have you noticed kind of any trends in the way that like conversations and relationships grow and play out over social media, both between journalists, between journalists and communications professionals, and even between readers? How, um, you know, how do you actually use Twitter and then you know social media in general to form relationships. I don't know if um, maybe Mark you could uh, you could start with that on how um, how people uh, kind of build relationships to get to know each other over Twitter. Sure. Well, uh, to tie it all together, you know, Twitter can be the first step to establishing relationships. Sometimes you know all it takes is a tweet to say, hey, can I uh, can I chat with you about something or can I grab a cup of coffee or you know talk with you offline. Um, for me, and I know a lot of other Twitter users, there are some people who you've never met with in person who you know a lot about through their Twitter feed, uh, both professionally and to some degree personally. And then uh, you know, when you meet in person or you finally connect, it's sort of like you already know that person. You already know that uh, what their personality is, their uh, what their interests are. And so social media is a great way to share your interests with others, uh, to get those conversations going. And ultimately on Twitter, a lot of people are looking for those one-to-one -one interactions. They're not necessarily looking to broadcast or or to, uh, to interact with a whole lot of people. They're just looking for people who have similar 
interest as, uh, as them. So being forthcoming, being about your uh, intentions, uh, reaching out to people directly, uh, all of that serves to uh, establish that relationship. But also remember, you know, get off your phone, get off your laptop, you know, go meet people in person. I like going to conferences and uh, meetups, tweet ups. So I can actually meet people in person and put a face to that Twitter feed. I would encourage you guys to do the same thing. Great. And, yeah, uh, I would echo. Go ahead, sorry. Unless there's oh, a question. I was going to ask I can... you for your thoughts, uh, Michael. That would be great. Sure. I don't know if anyone is going to the um, the Holmes Global PR Summit. It's coming up in, in I think, in about a week or two. Um, but to Mark's point, conferences are really important ways to extend your, your relationships. Uh, I always find before going to a conference, I'll go on a Twitter um, after identifying somebody who I know is going to attend. I'll tweet at them. I'll send them a direct message, ask if they want to meet up. I think a lot of times it's um, a great way to start a relationship with someone, a friendship, professional friendship, um, even if it's uh, you want to speak with someone who could be a client or you're want to talk to someone where you might want to work. Uh, it's a great platform to first uh, create a, a rapport with someone and then to ask for an in-person meeting. So I like that idea, Mark. Yeah, I like the, uh, that idea of online, offline, the kind of continuation both ways where um, it's easy to look at one and forget the other, but uh, we, we've seen very important to pull them together. And of course, uh, I, you know, know I, we shouldn't shouldn't discount, you know, the, of course, the relationships you build in social media. You can't always meet in person. And for that, I think it's really just to engage with people, to have conversations. If someone posts something interesting, to post a question back to them, to favorite it, to retweet it. Again, it's an invitation to start a a, a communication. Was that a Tinder advice the one or Twitter advice? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, go, go, uh, you're out to excuse my, uh, my sense of humor. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, the one thing I'll caution against, you know, there are some, as much as there are Twitter do's, there are Twitter don'ts as well. Uh, one is to uh, avoid Twitter stalking uh, someone, uh, favoriting every single tweet, retweeting every single tweet, uh, because it actually can have a negative impact and uh, make them less likely uh, to engage with you. And then the number one thing on Twitter, um, as I said, don't be the news, uh, is to don't argue on Twitter. Um, you know, people see that people, uh, you know, people that will reflect negatively on you. So you always want to, you know, if you're working in public relations, you know, you know, putting your best foot forward um, on social media as well as in person. So you want to make sure that you uh, think about that when you're using Twitter. Great, and I think with that, we're uh, we're coming up to one o'clock. Did um. Michael, Mark, did either of you have uh, kind of closing thoughts that you wanted to share? Nothing here. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone, for attending. I know they send around the presentation afterwards. And if you have any questions, feel free to find me on uh, Twitter or email or LinkedIn. Uh, same here. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, and if you guys have any questions after this, um, I'm at Marcus Lucky on Twitter. Great, thanks so much, guys. I assume you'll, uh, you'll you'll be on Twitter to take questions. Just to wrap this up, uh, thanks to my colleague Natan Ellsberg who organized all this at T W A T A N and uh, did all the legwork on this survey. Thanks again to uh, to our guests. And actually, before we close, I want to make sure that we we get these guys some followers so that they're well compensated. First of all, to Mark Lucky, at Mark S. Lucky. I've been a uh, longtime follower of his and can assure you won't regret following him. So make, make sure that you, uh, you connect with Mark on Twitter. Don't favorite every single tweet of his, though. Make sure it don't, don't go too far on that. And then, of course, uh, to our partners at NDC Partners, led by Michael Basick, who uh, joined us today. And again, give him a follow, at M. Basick or find him on, well, he's not on Tinder, but uh, find him on LO shortly. And thanks again for connecting. Uh, this was recorded. We'll find a way to uh, share the recording with everybody. We'll have the slides available. If you signed up for this uh, 
join me in advance, then you can um, you'll be on our list already, and we'll follow up with you. If you uh, if you didn't sign up in advance, then just reach out to us. Hello at muckrack.com. Tweet at muckrack. You can tweet me at Gregory and connect with me. And look forward to seeing you all on social media. Maybe seeing you in person at one of our upcoming muckrack events. If you sign up for an account, you'll get notified when we uh, come to your city for an event or at a future online connection. Thanks again to everybody who joined. And we'll uh, look forward to seeing your tweets. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.